This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane. Chapter 16. A sputtering of musketry was always to be heard. Later, the cannon had entered the dispute. In the fog-filled air the voices made a thudding sound. The reverberations were continual. This part of the world led a strange, battleful existence. The youth's regiment was marched to relieve a command that had lain long in some damp trenches. The men took positions behind a curving line of rifle pits that had been turned up, like a large furrow, along the lines of woods. Before them was a level stretch, peopled with short, deformed stumps. From the woods beyond came the dull popping of the skirmishes and pickets, firing in the fog. From the right came the noise of a terrific fracas. The men cuddled behind the small embankment and sat easy in attitudes awaiting their turn. Many had their backs to the firing. The youth's friend lay down, buried his face in his arms, and almost instantly, it seemed, he was in a deep sleep. The youth leaned his breast against the brown dirt and peered over at the woods and up and down the line. Curtains of these trees interfered with his ways of vision. He could see the low line of trenches, but for a short distance. A few idle flags were perched on the dirt hills. Beyond them were rows of dark bodies with a few heads sticking curiously over the top. Always the noise of skirmishers came from the woods on the front and left, and the din on the right had grown to frightful proportions. The guns were roaring without an instant's pause for breath. It seemed that the cannon had come from all parts and were engaged in a stupendous wrangle. It became impossible to make a sentence heard. The youth wished to launch a joke, a quotation from newspapers. He desired to say, "'All quiet on the Rappahannock,' but the guns refused to permit even a comment upon their uproar. He never successfully concluded the sentence. But at last the guns stopped, and among the men in the rifle pits rumors again flew, like birds, but they were now for the most part black creatures who flapped their wings drearily near to the ground and refused to rise on any wings of hope. The men's faces grew doleful from the interpreting of omens. Tales of hesitation and uncertainty on the part of those in high place and responsibility came to their ears. Stories of disaster were borne into their minds with many proofs. This din of musketry on the right, growing like a released genie of sound, expressed and emphasized the army's plight. The men were disheartened and began to mutter. They made gestures expressive of the sentence, "'Oh, what can we do?' and it could always be seen that they were bewildered by the alleged news and could not fully comprehend a defeat. Before the grey mists had been totally obliterated by the sun-rays, the regiment was marching in a spread column that was retiring carefully through the woods. The disordered, hurrying lines of the enemy could sometimes be seen down through the groves and little fields. They were yelling, shrill, and exultant. At this sight the youth forgot many personal matters and became greatly enraged, he exploded in loud sentences. But Jiminy were general by a lot of lunkheads. More than one feller has said that today, observed a man. His friend, recently aroused, was still very drowsy. He looked behind him until his mind took in the meaning of the movement. Then he sighed. <sighs> oh, well, I suppose we got licked, he remarked sadly. The youth had a thought that it would not be handsome for him to freely condemn other men. He made an attempt to restrain himself, but the words upon his tongue were too bitter. He presently began a long and intricate denunciation of the commander of the forces. Maybe it wasn't all his fault, not altogether. He did the best he knowed. It's our luck to get licked often, said his friend in a weary tone. He was trudging along with stooped shoulders and shifting eyes like a man who has been caned and kicked. "'Well, don't we fight like the devil? Don't we do all that men can?' demanded the youth loudly. He was secretly dumbfounded at this sentiment when it came from his lips. For a moment his face lost its valor and he looked guiltily about him. But no one questioned his right to deal in such words, and presently he recovered his air of courage. 
He went on to repeat a statement he had heard going from group to group at the camp that morning. The brigadier said he never saw a new regiment fight the way we fought yesterday, didn't he? And we didn't do better than many another regiment, did we? You can't say it's this army's fault, can you? In his reply, the friend's voice was stern. Of course not, he said. No man dare say we don't fight like the devil. No man will ever dare say it. The boys fight like hell roosters. But still, still we don't have no luck. Well then, if we fight like the devil and don't ever whip, it must be the general's fault, said the youth grandly and decisively. And I don't see any sense in fighting and fighting and fighting, yet always losing through some derned old lunkhead of a general. A sarcastic man who was tramping at the youth's side then spoke lazily. Maybe you think you fit the whole battle yesterday, Fleming, he remarked. The speech pierced the youth. Inwardly he was reduced to an abject pulp by these chance words. His legs quaked privately. He cast a frightened glance at the sarcastic man. "'Why, no,' he hastened to say in a conciliating voice. "'I don't think I fought the whole battle yesterday.' But the other seemed innocent of any deeper meaning. Apparently he had no information. It was merely his habit. "'Oh,' he replied in the same tone of calm derision. The youth, nevertheless, felt a threat. His mind shrank from going near to the danger, and thereafter he was silent." The significance of the sarcastic man's words took from him all loud moods that would make him appear prominent. He became suddenly a modest person. There was low-toned talk among the troops. The officers were impatient and snappy, their countenances clouded with the tales of misfortune. The troops, sifting through the forest, were sullen. In the youth's company once a man's laugh rang out. A dozen soldiers turned their faces quickly toward him and frowned with vague displeasure. The noise of firing dogged their footsteps. Sometimes it seemed to be driven a little way, but it always returned again with increased insolence. The men muttered and cursed, throwing black looks in its direction. In a clear space the troops were at last halted. Regiments and brigades, broken and detached through their encounters with thickets, grew together again and lines were faced towards the pursuing bark of the enemy's infantry. The noise, following like yelpings of eager metallic hounds, increased to a loud and joyous burst, and then, as the sun went serenely up the sky, throwing illuminating rays into the gloomy thickets, it broke forth into prolonged peelings. The woods began to crackle as if afire. whoop a da da dee said a man. "'Here we are!' "'Everybody fighting, blood and destruction!' "'I was willing to bet they'd attack as soon as the sun got fairly up,' savagely asserted the lieutenant who commanded the youth's company. He jerked without mercy at his little moustache. Then he strode to and fro with dark dignity in the rear of his men, who were lying down behind whatever protection they had collected. A battery had trundled into position in the rear and was thoughtfully shelling the distance. The regiment, unmolested as yet— awaited the moment when the grey shadows of the woods before them should be slashed by the lines of flame. There was much growling and swearing. "'Good God!' the youth grumbled. "'We're always being chased around like rats. It makes me sick. Nobody seems to know where we go or why we go. We just get fired around from pillar to post and get licked here and get licked there, and nobody knows what it's done for.' It makes a man feel like a damn kitten in a bag. Now I'd like to know what the eternal thunders we was marched into these woods for anyhow, unless it was to give the rebs a regular pot shot at us. We came in here and got our legs all tangled up in these cussed briars, and then we begin to fight and the rebs had an easy time of it. Don't tell me it's just luck. I know better. It's this derned old... The friend seemed jaded. But he interrupted his comrade with a voice of calm confidence. "'It'll turn out all right in the end,' he said. "'Oh, the devil it will! You always talk like a dog-hanged parson. Don't tell me. I know.' At this time there was an interposition by the savage-minded lieutenant, who was obliged to vent some of his inward dissatisfaction upon his men. "'You boys shut right up!' 
There's no need of your wasting your breath in long-winded arguments about this and that and the other. You've been jawing like a lot of old hens. All you've got to do is fight, and you'll get plenty of that to do in about ten minutes. Less talking and more fighting is what's best for you boys. I never saw such gabbling jackasses. He paused, ready to pounce upon any man who might have the temerity to reply. No words being said, he resumed his dignified pacing. "'There's too much chin music and too little fighting in this war anyhow,' he said to them, turning his head for a final remark. The day had grown more white, until the sun shed his full radiance upon the thronged forest. A sort of a gust of battle came sweeping toward that part of the line where lay the youth's regiment. The front shifted a trifle to meet it squarely. There was a wait. In this part of the field there passed slowly the intense moments that precede the tempest. A single rifle flashed in a thicket before the regiment. In an instant it was joined by many others. There was a mighty song of clashes and crashes that went sweeping through the woods, the guns in the rear aroused and enraged by shells that had been thrown burr-like at them suddenly involved themselves in a hideous altercation with another band of guns. The battle roar settled to a rolling thunder, which was a single long explosion. In the regiment there was a peculiar kind of hesitation denoted in the attitudes of the men. They were worn, exhausted, having slept but little and labored much. They rolled their eyes towards the advancing battle as they stood awaiting the shock. Some shrank and flinched. They stood as men tied to stakes. End of chapter 16 Read by Sandra in Wales, United Kingdom June 2006is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Robinson. The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane. Chapter 17. This advance of the enemy had seemed to the youth like a ruthless hunting. He began to fume with rage and exasperation. He beat his foot upon the ground, and scowled with hate at the swirling smoke that was approaching like a phantom flood. There was a maddening quality in this seeming resolution of the foe to give him no rest, to give him no time to sit down and think. Yesterday he had fought, and had fled rapidly. There had been many adventures, for today he felt that he had earned opportunities for contemplative repose. He could have enjoyed portraying to uninitiated listeners various scenes at which he had been a witness or ably discussing the processes of war with other proved men. Two, it was important that he should have time for physical recuperation. He was sore and stiff from his experiences. He had received his fill of all exertions, and he wished to rest. But those other men never seemed to grow weary. They were fighting with their old speed. He had a wild hate for the relentless foe. Yesterday, when he had imagined the universe to be against him, he had hated it, little gods and big gods. Today, he hated the army of the foe with the same great hatred. He was not going to be badgered of his life, like a kitten chased by boys, he said. It was not well to drive men into final corners. At those moments, they could all develop teeth and claws. He leaned and spoke into his friend's ear. He menaced the woods with a gesture. If they keep on chasing us by God, they'd better watch out. Can't stand too much. The friend twisted his head, and made a calm reply. If they keep on a-chasing us, they'll drive us all into the river. The youth cried out savagely at this statement. He crouched behind a little tree, with his eyes burning hatefully, and his teeth set in a curl-like snarl. The awkward bandage was still about his head, and upon it, over his wound, there was a spot of dry blood. His hair was wondrously tousled and some straggling, moving locks hung over the cloth of the bandage down toward his forehead. His jacket and shirt were open at the throat, and exposed his young, bronzed neck. There could be seen spasmodic gulpings at his throat. His fingers twined nervously about his rifle. He wished that it was an engine of annihilating power. He felt that he and his companions were being taunted 
and derided from sincere convictions that they were poor and puny. His knowledge of his inability to take vengeance for it made his rage into a dark and stormy specter that possessed him and made him dream of abominable cruelties. The tormentors were flies, sucking insolently at his blood, and he thought that he would have given his life for a revenge of seeing their faces in pitiful plights. The winds of battle had swept all about the regiment, until the one rifle, instantly followed by others, flashed in its front. A moment later the regiment roared forth its sudden and valiant retort. A dense wall of smoke settled down. It was furiously slit and slashed by the knife-like fire from the rifles. To the youth the fighters resembled animals, tossed for a death struggle into a dark pit. There was a sensation that he and his fellows at bay were pushing back, always pushing fierce onslaughts of creatures who were slippery. Their beams of crimson seemed to get no purchase upon the bodies of their foes. The latter seemed to evade them with ease and come through, between, around, and about with unopposed skill. When, in a dream, it occurred to the youth that his rifle was an impotent stick, he lost sense of everything but his hate, his desire to smash into pulp the glittering smile of victory which he could feel upon the faces of his enemies. The blue, smoke-swallowed line curled and writhed like a snake stepped upon. It swung its ends to and fro in an agony of fear and rage. The youth was not conscious that he was erect upon his feet. He did not know the direction of the ground. Indeed, once he even lost the habit of balance and fell heavily. He was up again immediately. One thought went through the chaos of his brain at the time. He wondered if he had fallen because he had been shot. But the suspicion flew away at once. He did not think more of it. He had taken up a first position behind the little tree, with the direct determination to hold it against the world. He had not deemed it possible that his army could that day succeed, and from this he felt the ability to fight harder. But the throng had surged in all ways, until he lost directions and locations, save that he knew where lay the enemy. The flames bit him, and the hot smoke broiled his skin. His rifle barrel grew so hot that ordinarily he could not have borne it upon his palm, but he kept on stuffing cartridges into it, and pounding them with his clanking, bending ramrod. If he aimed at some changing form through the smoke, he pulled the trigger with a fierce grunt, as if he were dealing a blow of the fist with all his strength. When the enemy seemed falling back before him and his fellows, he went instantly forward, like a dog who, seeing his foes lagging, turns and insists upon being pursued, and when he was compelled to retire again, he did it slowly, sullenly, taking steps of wrathful despair. Once, he, in his intent hate, was almost done, and was firing, when all those near him had ceased. He was so engrossed in his occupation that he was not aware of a lull. He was recalled by a hoarse laugh, and a sentence that came to his ears in a voice of contempt and amazement. "'You infernal fool! Don't you know enough to quit when there ain't anything to shoot at? Good God!' He turned then, and, pausing with his rifle thrown half into position, looked at the blue line of his comrades. During this moment of leisure, they seemed to all be engaged in staring with astonishment at him. They had become spectators. Turning to the front again, he saw, under the lifted smoke, a deserted ground. He looked bewildered for a moment. Then there appeared upon the glazed vacancy of his eyes a diamond point of intelligence. Oh, he said, comprehending. He returned to his comrades and threw himself upon the ground. He sprawled like a man who had been thrashed. His flesh seemed strangely on fire, and the sounds of the battle continued in his ears. He groped blindly for his canteen. The lieutenant was crowing. He seemed drunk with fighting. He called out to the youth, "'By heavens, if I had ten thousand wildcats like you, I could tear the stomach out of this war in less than a week.' He puffed out his chest with large dignity as he said it. Some of the men muttered and looked at the youth in awestruck ways. It was plain that as he had gone on loading and firing and cursing without proper intermission, they had found time to regard him, and they now looked upon him as a war devil. The friend came staggering to him. There was some fright and dismay in his voice. "'Are you all right, Fleming? Do you feel all right? There ain't nothing the matter with you, Henry, is there?' "'No,' said the youth, with difficulty. His throat seemed full of knobs and burrs. These incidents made the youth ponder. It was revealed to him that he had been a barbarian, a beast. He had fought like a pagan who defends his religion. Regarding it, he saw that it was fine, wild, and in some ways easy. He had been a tremendous figure, no doubt, 
By this struggle he had overcome obstacles which he had admitted to be mountains. They had fallen like paper peaks, and he was now what he called a hero. And he had not been aware of the process. He had slept, and, awakening, found himself a knight. He lay and basked in the occasional stares of his comrades. Their faces were buried in degrees of blackness from the burnt powder. Some were utterly smudged. They were reeking with perspiration, and their breaths came hard and wheezing. And from these soiled expanses they peered at him. "'Hot work! Hot work!' cried the lieutenant deliriously. He walked up and down, restless and eager. Sometimes his voice could be heard in a wild, incomprehensible laugh. When he had a particularly profound thought upon the science of war, he always unconsciously addressed himself to the youth. There was some grim rejoicing by the men. "'By thunder! I bet the Samuel never see a new regiment like us!' "'You bet! A dog, a woman, and a walnut tree. The more you beat em, the better they be. That's like us!' Lost a pile of men, they did. If an old woman swept up the woods, she'd get a dustpan full. Yes, and if she'll come around again in about an hour, she'll get a pile more. The forest still bore its burden of clamor. From off under the trees came the rolling clatter of the musketry. Each distant thicket seemed a strange porcupine with quills of flame. A cloud of dark smoke, as from smoldering ruins, went up toward the sun, now bright and gay, in the blue enameled sky. End of chapter 17「Is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Robinson. The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane. Chapter 18. The ragged line had respite for some minutes, but during its pause, the struggle in the forest became magnified until the trees seemed to quiver from the firing and the ground to shake from the rushing of men. The voices of the cannon were mingled in a long and interminable row. It seemed difficult to live in such an atmosphere. The chests of the men strained for a bit of freshness, and their throats craved water. There was one shot through the body, who raised a cry of bitter lamentation when came this lull. Perhaps he had been calling out during the fighting also, but at that time no one had heard him. But now the men turned at the woeful complaints of him upon the ground. Who is it? Who is it? It's Jimmy Rogers. Jimmy Rogers. When their eyes first encountered him, there was a sudden halt, as if they feared to go near. He was thrashing about in the grass, twisting his shuddering body into many strange postures. He was screaming loudly. This instant's hesitation seemed to fill him with a tremendous, fantastic contempt, and he damned them in shrieked sentences. The youth's friend had a geographical illusion concerning a stream, and he obtained permission to go for some water. Immediately, canteens were showered upon him. "'Fill mine, will you?' "'Bring me some, too.' "'And me, too.' He departed, laden. The youth went with his friend, feeling a desire to throw his heated body into the stream and, soaking there, drink quartz. They made a hurried search for the supposed stream, but did not find it. "'No water here.' said the youth. They turned without delay, and began to retrace their steps. From their position, as they again faced toward the place of the fighting, they could have comprehended a greater amount of the battle than when their visions had been blurred by the hurling smoke of the line. They could see dark stretches winding along the land, and on one cleared space there was a row of guns making gray clouds, which were filled with large flashes of orange-colored flame. Over some foliage they could see the roof of a house, one window, glowing a deep murder red, shone squarely through the leaves. From the edifice, a tall, leaning tower of smoke went far into the sky. Looking over their own troops, they saw mixed masses slowly getting into regular form. The sunlight made twinkling points of the bright steel. To the rear, there was a glimpse of a distant roadway as it curved over a slope. It was crowded with retreating infantry. From all the interwoven forest arose the smoke and bluster of the battle. The air was always occupied by a blaring. Near where they stood, shells were flip-flapping and hooting. Occasional bullets buzzed in the air and spanged into tree trunks. Wounded men and other stragglers were slinking through the woods. Looking down an aisle of the grove, the youth and his companion saw a jangling general and his staff almost ride upon a wounded man, who was crawling on his hands and knees, 
The general reined strongly at his charger's opened and foamy mouth and guided it with dexterous horsemanship past the man. The latter scrambled in wild and torturing haste. His strength evidently failed him as he reached a place of safety. One of his arms suddenly weakened, and he fell, sliding over upon his back. He lay stretched out, breathing gently. A moment later the small, creaking cavalcade was directly in front of the two soldiers. Another officer, riding with the skillful abandon of a cowboy, galloped his horse to a position directly before the general. The two unnoticed foot-soldiers made a little show of going on, but they lingered near in the desire to overhear the conversation. Perhaps, they thought, some great inner historical things would be said. The general, whom the boys knew as the commander of their division, looked at the other officer and spoke coolly, as if he were criticizing his clothes. "'The enemy's foreman over there for another charge,' he said. "'It'll be directed against Widerside, and I fear they'll break through unless we work like thunder to stop them.' The other swore at his restive horse, and then cleared his throat. He made a gesture toward his cap. "'It'll be hell to pay stopping them,' he said shortly. "'I presume so,' remarked the general. Then he began to talk rapidly and in a lower tone. He frequently illustrated his words with a pointing finger. The two infantrymen could hear nothing, until finally he asked, "'What troops can you spare?' The officer who rode like a cowboy reflected for an instant. "'Well,' he said, "'I had to order in the twelfth to help the seventy-sixth, and I haven't really got any, but there is the three hundred and fourth. They fight like a lot of mule drivers. I can spare them best of any.' The youth and his friend exchanged glances of astonishment. The general spoke sharply. "'Get him ready, then. I'll watch developments from here, and send you word when to start them. It'll happen in five minutes.' As the other officer tossed his fingers toward his cap and, wheeling his horse, started away, the general called out to him in a sober voice, "'I don't believe many of your mule drivers will get back.' The other shouted something in reply. He smiled. With scared faces, the youth and his companion hurried back to the line. These happenings had occupied an incredibly short time, yet the youth felt that in them he had been made aged. New eyes were given to him, and the most startling thing was to learn suddenly that he was very insignificant. The officer spoke of the regiment as if he referred to a broom. Some part of the woods needed sweeping, perhaps, and he merely indicated a broom in a tone properly indifferent to its fate. It was war, no doubt, but it appeared strange. As the two boys approached the line, the lieutenant perceived them and swelled with wrath. Fleming? Wilson? How long does it take you to get water? Anyhow, where you been to? But his oration ceased as he saw their eyes, which were large with great tails. We're going to charge! We're going to charge! cried the youth's friend, hastening with his news. Charge! said the lieutenant. Charge! Well, by God! Now this is real fightin'. Over his soiled countenance there went a boastful smile. Charge! Well, by God! A little group of soldiers surrounded the two youths. Are we, sure enough? Well, I'll be durned. Charge! What fur? What at? Wilson, you're lying. I hope to die, said the youth, pitching his tones to the key of angry remonstrance. Sure as shooting, I tell you. And his friend spoke in reinforcement. Not by a blame sight, he ain't lying. We heard him talkin'. They caught sight of two mounted figures a short distance from them. One was the colonel of the regiment, and the other was the officer who had received orders from the commander of the division. They were gesticulating at each other. The soldier, pointing at them, interpreted the scene. One man had a final objection. How could you hear him talking? But the men, for a large part, nodded, admitting that previously the two friends had spoken truth. They settled back into reposeful attitudes, with airs of having accepted the matter, and they mused upon it, with a hundred varieties of expression. It was an engrossing thing to think about. Many tightened their belts carefully and hitched at their trousers. A moment later the officers began to hustle among the men, pushing them into a more compact mass and into a better alignment. They chased those that straggled, and fumed at a few men who seemed to show by their attitudes that they had decided to remain at that spot. They were like critical shepherds, struggling with sheep. Presently the regiment seemed to draw itself up and heave a deep breath. None of the men's faces were mirrors of large thoughts. The soldiers were bended and stooped like sprinters before a signal. 
many pairs of glinting eyes peered from the grimy faces toward the curtains of the deeper woods. They seemed to be engaged in deep calculations of time and distance. They were surrounded by the noises of the monstrous altercation between the two armies. The world was fully interested in other matters. Apparently, the regiment had its small affair to itself. The youth, turning, shot a quick, inquiring glance at his friend. The latter returned to him the same manner of look. They were the only ones who possessed an inner knowledge. Mule drivers. Hell to pay. Don't believe many will get back. It was an ironical secret. Still, they saw no hesitation in each other's faces, and they nodded a mute and unprotesting assent when a shaggy man near them said in a meek voice, We'll get swallowed. End of chapter 18「All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Neil Pankey. The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane. Chapter 19. The youth stared at the land in front of him. Its foliages now seemed to veil powers and horrors. He was unaware of the machinery of orders that started the charge, although from the corners of his eyes he saw an officer who looked like a boy a horseback come galloping waving his hat. Suddenly he felt a straining and heaving among the men. The line fell slowly forward like a toppling wall, and with a convulsive gasp that was intended for a cheer, the regiment began its journey. The youth was pushed and jostled for a moment before he understood the movement at all, but directly he lunged ahead and began to run. He fixed his eye upon a distant and prominent clump of trees where he had concluded the enemy were to be met, and he ran toward it as toward a goal. He had believed throughout that it was a mere question of getting over an unpleasant matter as quickly as possible, and he ran desperately, as if pursued for a murder. His face was drawn hard and tight with the stress of his endeavor. His eyes were fixed in a lurid glare, and with his soiled and disordered dress, his red and inflamed features surmounted by the dingy rag with its spot of blood, his wildly swinging rifle and banging accoutrements, he looked to be an insane soldier. As the regiment swung from its position out into a cleared space, the woods and thickets before it awakened. Yellow flames leaped toward it from many directions. The forest made a tremendous objection. The line lurched straight for a moment, then the right wing swung forward. It in turn was surpassed by the left. Afterward, the center careered to the front until the regiment was a wedge-shaped mass, but an instant later the opposition of bushes, trees, and uneven places on the ground split the command and scattered it into detached clusters. The youth, light-footed, was unconsciously in advance. His eyes still kept note of the clump of trees. From all places near it, the clannish yell of the enemy could be heard. The little flames of rifles leaped from it. The song of the bullets was in the air, and shells snarled among the treetops. One tumbled directly into the middle of a hurrying group and exploded in crimson fury. There was an instant spectacle of a man, almost over it, throwing up his hands to shield his eyes. Other men, punched by bullets, fell in grotesque agonies. The regiment left a coherent trail of bodies. They had passed into a cleaner atmosphere. There was, an effect, like a revelation in the new appearance of the landscape. Some men, working madly at a battery, were plain to them and the opposing infantry's lines were defined by the gray walls and fringes of smoke. It seemed to the youth that he saw everything. Each blade of the green grass was bold and clear. He thought that he was aware of every change in the thin, transparent vapor that floated idly in the sheets. The brown or gray trunks of the trees showed each roughness of their surfaces, and the men of the regiment, with their starting eyes and sweating faces, running madly or falling, as if thrown headlong to queer, heaped-up corpses, all were comprehended. His mind took a mechanical but firm impression, so that afterward everything was pictured and explained to him, save why he himself was there. But there was a frenzy made from this furious rush. The men, pitching forward insanely, had burst into cheerings, mob-like and barbaric, but tuned in strange keys that can arouse the dullard and stoic. It made a mad enthusiasm that, it seemed, would be incapable of checking itself before granite and brass. There was the delirium that encounters despair and death, and is heedless and blind to the odds. It is a temporary but sublime absence of selfishness, and because it was of this order was the reason, perhaps, why the youth wondered, afterward, what reasons he could have had for being there. Presently the straining pace ate up the energies of the men, as if by agreement the leaders began to slacken their speed. 
The volleys directed against them had a seeming wind-like effect. The regiment snorted and blew. Among some stolid trees it began to falter and hesitate. The men, staring intently, began to wait for some of the distant walls of smoke to move and disclose to them the scene. Since much of their strength and their breath had vanished, they returned to caution. They were become men again. The youth had a vague belief that he had run miles, and he thought, in a way, that he was now in some new and unknown land. The moment the regiment ceased its advance, the protesting splutter of musketry became a steadied roar. Long and accurate fringes of smoke spread out. From the top of a small hill came level belchings of yellow flame that caused an inhuman whistling in the air. The men, halted, had some opportunity to see some of their comrades, dropping with moans and shrieks. A few lay underfoot, still or wailing, and now for an instant the men stood, their rifles slack in their hands, and watched the regiment dwindle. They appeared dazed and stupid. This spectacle seemed to paralyze them. Overcome them with a fatal fascination, they stared woodenly at the sights, and lowering their eyes, looked from face to face. It was a strange pause and a strange silence. Then, above the sounds of the outside commotion, arose the roar of the lieutenant. He strode suddenly forth, his infantile features black with rage. "'Come on, you fools!' he bellowed. "'Come on! You can't stay here. You must come on!' He said more, but much of it could not be understood. He started rapidly forward, with his head turned toward the men. "'Come on!' he was shouting. The men stared with blank and yokel-like eyes at him. He was obliged to halt and retrace his steps. He stood, then with his back to the enemy, and delivered gigantic curses into the faces of the men. His body vibrated from the weight and force of his imprecations, and he could string oaths with the facility of a maiden who strings beads. The friend of the youth aroused. Lurching suddenly forward and dropping to his knees, he fired an angry shot at the persistent woods. This action awakened the men. They huddled no more like sheep. They seemed suddenly to bethink themselves of their weapons, and at once commenced firing. Belabored by their officers, they began to move forward. The regiment, involved like a cart involved in mud and muddle, started uneventfully with many jolts and jerks. The men stopped, now every few paces, to fire and load, and in this manner moved slowly on from trees to trees. The flaming opposition in their front grew with their advance until it seemed that all forward ways were barred by the thin leaping tongues and off to the right an ominous demonstration could sometimes be dimly discerned. The smoke lately generated was in confusing clouds that made it difficult for the regiment to proceed with intelligence. As he passed through each curling mass, the youth wondered what could confront him on the farther side. The command went painfully forward until an open space interposed between them and the lurid lines. Here, crouching and cowering behind some trees, the men clung with desperation, as if threatened by a wave. They looked wild-eyed, and as if amazed at this furious disturbance they had stirred. In the storm there was an ironical expression of their importance. The faces of the men, too, showed a lack of certain feeling of responsibility for being there. It was as if they had been driven. It was the dominant animal failing to remember in the supreme moments the forceful causes of various superficial qualities. The whole affair seemed incomprehensible to many of them. As they halted thus, the lieutenant again began to bellow profanely. Regardless of the vindictive threats of the bullets, he went about coaxing, berating, and bedamning. His lips, that were habitually in a soft and childlike curve, were now writhed into unholy contortions. He swore by all possible deities. Once he grabbed the youth by the arm. Come on, you lunkhead, he roared. Come on. We'll all get killed if we stay here. We've only got to go across that lot. And then the remainder of his idea but disappeared in a blue haze of curses. The youth stretched forth his arm. Cross there? His mouth was puckered in doubt and awe. Certainly, just cross the lot. We can't stay here, screamed the lieutenant. He poked his face close to the youth and waved his bandaged hand. Come on. Presently he grappled with him, as if for a wrestling bout. It was as if he planned to drag the youth by the ear on to the assault. The private felt a sudden unspeakable indignation against his officer. He wrenched fiercely and shook him off. Come on yourself, then, he yelled. There was a bitter challenge in his voice. They galloped together down the regimental front. The friends scrambled after them. In front of the colors, the three men began to bawl. Come on, come on, they danced and gyrated like tortured savages. The flag, obedient to these appeals, bended its glittering form and swept toward them. The men wavered in indecision for a moment, and then, with a long, wailful cry, the dilapidated regiment surged forward and began its new journey. Over the field went the scurrying mass. It was a handful of men splattered into the faces of the enemy. Toward it instantly sprang the yellow tongues. A vast quantity of blue smoke hung before them. A mighty banging made ears valueless.
The youth ran like a madman to reach the woods before a bullet could discover him. He ducked his head low like a football player. In his haste, his eyes almost closed, and then the scene was a wild blur. Pulsating saliva stood at the corners of his mouth. Within him, as he hurled himself forward, was born a love, a despairing fondness for this flag which was near him. It was a creation of beauty and invulnerability. It was a goddess, radiant, that bended its form with an imperious gesture to him. It was a woman, red and white, hating and loving, that called him with the voice of his hopes. Because no harm could come to it, he endowed it with power. He kept near, as if it could be a savor of life, and an imploring cry went from his mind. In the mad scramble he was aware that the color sergeant flinched suddenly, as if struck by a bludgeon. He faltered and then became motionless, save for his quivering knees. He made a spring and a clutch at the pole. At the same instant his friend grabbed at it from the other side. They jerked at it, stout and furious, but the color sergeant was dead, and the corpse would not relinquish its trust. For a moment there was a grim encounter. The dead man, swinging with bended back, seemed to be obstinately tugging, in ludicrous and awful ways, for the possession of the flag. It was past an instant of time. They wrenched the flag furiously from the dead man, and, as they turned again, the corpse swayed forward with bowed head. One arm swung high, and the curved hand fell with heavy protest on the friend's unheeding shoulder. End of chapter 19
when he knew that he and his comrades had failed to do anything in successful ways that might bring the little pangs of kind remorse upon the officer, the youth allowed the rage of the baffled to possess him. This cold officer upon a monument, who dropped epithets unconcernedly down, would be finer as a dead man, he thought. So grievous did he think it that he could never possess the secret right to taunt truly in answer. He had pictured red letters of curious revenge. We are mule-drivers, are we? and now he was compelled to throw them away. He presently wrapped his heart in the cloak of his pride and kept the flag erect. He harangued his fellows, pushing against their chests with his free hand. To those he knew well he made frantic appeals, beseeching them by name. Between him and the lieutenant, scolding and near to losing his mind with rage, there was felt a subtle fellowship and equality. They supported each other in all manner of hoarse howling protests. But the regiment was a machine run down. The two men babbled at a forceless thing. The soldiers who had heart to go slowly were continually shaken in their resolves by a knowledge that comrades were slipping with speed back to the lines. It was difficult to think of reputation when others were thinking of skins. Wounded men were left crying on this black journey. The smoke fringes and flames blustered always. The youth, peering once through a sudden rift in a cloud, saw a brown mass of troops, interwoven and magnified until they appeared to be thousands. A fierce-hued flag flashed before his vision. Immediately, as if the uplifting of the smoke had been prearranged, the discovered troops burst into a rasping yell, and a hundred flames jetted toward the retreating band. A rolling gray cloud again interposed as the regiment doggedly replied— the youth had to depend again upon his misused ears, which were trembling and buzzing from the melee of musketry and yells. The way seemed eternal. In the clouded haze men became panic-stricken with the thought that the regiment had lost its path and was proceeding in a perilous direction. Once the men who headed the wild procession turned and came pushing back against their comrades, screaming that they were being fired upon from points which they had considered to be towards their own lines. At this cry a hysterical fear and dismay beset the troops. A soldier, who heretofore had been ambitious to make the regiment into a wise little band that would proceed calmly against the huge appearing difficulties, suddenly sank down and buried his face in his arms with an air of bowing to a doom. From another a shrill lamentation rang out filled with profane allusions to a general. Men ran hither and thither, seeking with their eyes roads of escape. With serene regularity, as if controlled by a schedule, bullets buffed into men. The youth walked stolidly into the midst of the mob, and with his flag in his hands took a stand as if he expected an attempt to push him to the ground. He unconsciously assumed the attitude of the color-bearer in the fight of the preceding day. He passed over his brow a hand that trembled. His breath did not come freely. He was choking during this small wait for the crisis. His friend came up to him. "'Well, Henry, I guess this is good-bye, John.' "'Oh, shut up, you damned fool!' replied the youth, and he would not look at the other. The officers laboured like politicians to beat the mass into a proper circle to face the menaces. The ground was uneven and torn. The men curled into depressions and fitted themselves snugly behind whatever would frustrate a bullet. The youth noted with vague surprise that the lieutenant was standing mutely with his legs far apart and his sword held in the manner of a cane. The youth wondered what had happened to his vocal organs that he no more cursed. There was something curious in this little intent pause of the lieutenant. He was like a babe which, having wept its fill, raises its eyes and fixes upon a distant toy. He was engrossed in his contemplation, and the soft underlip quivered from self-whispered words. Some lazy and ignorant smoke curled slowly. The men, hiding from the bullets, waited anxiously for it to lift and disclose the plight of the regiment. The silent ranks were suddenly thrilled by the eager voice of the youthful lieutenant bawling out, "'Here they come! Ride on to us, by God!' His further words were lost in a roar of wicked thunder from the men's rifles. The youth's eyes had instantly turned in the direction indicated by the awakened and agitated lieutenant, and he had seen the haze of treachery disclosing a body of soldiers of the enemy. They were so near that he could see their features. There was a recognition as he looked at the types of their faces. Also he perceived with dim amazement that their uniforms were rather gay in effect, being light grey, accented with a brilliant-hued facing. Too, the clothes seemed new, 
These troops had apparently been going forward with caution, their rifles held in readiness, when the youthful lieutenant had discovered them and their movement had been interrupted by the volley from the blue regiment. From the moment's glimpse it was derived that they had been unaware of the proximity of their dark-suited foes, or had mistaken the direction. Almost instantly they were shut utterly from the youth's sight by the smoke from the energetic rifles of his companions. He strained his vision to learn the accomplishment of the volley, but the smoke hung before him. The two bodies of troops exchanged blows in the manner of a pair of boxers. The fast, angry firing went back and forth. The men in blue were intent with the despair of their circumstances, and they seized upon the revenge to be had at close range. Their thunder swelled loud and valiant, their curving front bristled with flashes, and the place resounded with the clangor of their ramrods. The youth ducked and dodged for a time, and achieved a few unsatisfactory views of the enemy. There appeared to be many of them, and they were replying swiftly. They seemed moving toward the blue regiment, step by step. He seated himself gloomily on the ground with his flag between his knees. As he noted the vicious wolf-like temper of his comrades, he had a sweet thought that if the enemy was about to swallow the regimental broom as a large prisoner, it could at least have the consolation of going down with bristles forward. But the blows of the antagonist began to grow more weak. Fewer bullets ripped the air, and finally, when the men slackened to learn of the fight, they could only see dark floating smoke. The regiment lay still and gazed. Presently some chance whim came to the pestering blur, and it began to coil heavily away. The men saw a ground vacant of fighters. It would have been an empty stage if it were not for the few corpses that lay thrown and twisted into fantastic shapes upon the sword. At the sight of this tableau, many of the men in blue sprang from behind their covers and made an ungainly dance of joy. Their eyes burned, and a hoarse cheer of elation broke from their dry lips. It had begun to seem to them that the events were trying to prove that they were impotent. These little battles had evidently endeavored to demonstrate that men could not fight well. When on the verge of submission to these opinions, the small duel had shown them that the proportions were not impossible, and by it they had revenged themselves upon their misgivings and upon the foe. The impetus of enthusiasm was theirs again. They gazed about them with looks of uplifted pride, feeling a new trust in the grim, always confident weapons in their hands. And they were men. End of chapter 20